Good morning. I'm Bill Brown, pastor of Rufton Memorial Presbyterian Church in Charleston, West Virginia. Well, finally on Wednesday, work started on the roof of the sanctuary of the church. The weather doesn't look like it's going to be too cooperative, so I don't know for sure of the completion date. We will soon be replacing the boiler in our church, but work will not commence for a while as boilers are not an off-the-shelf item. I'd hope by this time we might be seeing a reduction in COVID-19 cases, but that doesn't seem to be the case. The fact is we are seeing increases that equal the earlier spikes of this year and with them days of almost a thousand deaths. Forty of our states are showing increases and on Wednesday of last week one person died from COVID-19 complications every 90 seconds. Health officials and doctors tell us that two simple expediencies Masks and physical distancing can reduce the spread of COVID-19 dramatically and rapidly. Ask yourself, with infections increasing, why do some people still refuse to have concern for their fellow citizens? It's not political to wear a mask. It's science and it's caring for others. Continue keeping first responders and healthcare professionals in your prayers. They need all the prayers they can get. And while you're on your knees, say a prayer for all of the dedicated scientists working on vaccines and treatments for COVID-19. Don't forget, November 3rd is election day. Exercise the privilege you have and vote. Let us pray together. We give you thanks, O God, for all the saints who ever worshiped you, whether in nature or in cathedrals, whether in wood, wooden churches or crumbling cement meeting houses, where your name is lifted and adored. We give you thanks, O God, for the hands lifted in praise manicured hands and hands stained with grease and soil, strong hands and hands gnarled with age. We thank you, God, for hard-working saints, whether hard-hatted or ragged or aproned, blue-collared or three-piece suited. They left their mark on the earth for you, for us, and for our children to come. Thank you, God, for the tremendous sacrifices made by those who have gone before us. Bless the memories of your saints. May we learn how to walk wisely from their examples of faith and dedication and worship and love. We praise your name and we make this prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
scripture this morning is from the book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter, the first through the third verse. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd, cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, its shame, and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This is the word of the Lord. This is All Saints Sunday. There's an old Scottish prayer from ghoulies and ghosties and long-legged beasties and things that go bump in the night. Good Lord, deliver us. Last night was Halloween. Where did Halloween come from? Do other cultures celebrate the tradition? Does it tell us anything meaningful about life after death? The Celts were people who inhabited extensive parts of Europe and the British Isles. They had a colorful fall festival called Shamhain to honor their dead. The festivities were celebrated at the end of October and the beginning of November and were marked by the beginning of winter. The Celts believed that on the night of October 31st, the spirits of the dead came back to visit their earthly homes. To please the spirits of their loved ones and to keep the bad spirits away, the Celts would leave food and sweets outside their homes, a tradition that gave way to what we now call trick-or-treat. When Roman Catholicism came into contact with the Celts, an effort was made to fuse their fall festival and traditions into Catholicism. That is how November 1st became All Saints Day, a day to honor the dead. The night of October 31st, Eve of All Saints Day, was called All Hallows' Eve from which we derive our word Halloween. The original Celtic beliefs were not completely lost. On the night of October 31st, we still see witches and ghosts. Here in the United States, we see carved pumpkins, witches and black cats, and all types of decorations children dress in costumes and go trick-or-treating and they get together and watch scary movies. These traditions came to America from Scotland and Ireland and it has evolved into our trick-or-treat night. Instead of spirits of ancestors or evil spirits, children dress up in costumes and collect sweets from neighbors. It has all but lost its original meaning, but it does keep the great candy manufacturers in business between Easter and Christmas. But what about its original intent? What about the veneration of all the saints that have gone before? One day, a man and his five-year-old son were walking through a beautiful church The church was filled with bright light from the many colorful stained glass windows. As the boy looked at the windows, he asked, who are all those people in the windows? They're saints, his father answered. What are saints, the boy asked. At that, the father was stuck for an answer and was silent for a minute or two. How was he going to explain what a saint was to a five-year-old boy? As the boy kept looking up at the windows, 
and the father was still wondering how to explain what a saint was, suddenly the boy said, I know what a saint is, Daddy. They are people that light shines through. It's hard for me to believe that it's November 1st already. I've just gotten used to writing 2020 and now it's almost over. I grew up in the Presbyterian Church of the United States, the PCUS or the Southern Presbyterian Church. And to the best of my memory, we didn't give much thought to All Saints Day. I did learn that it was a day to remember those who have gone on before and have been faithful in their Christian beliefs. Those who have suffered persecution and even death professing their faith in Jesus Christ. We remember the saints who have, by God's grace, served the church and the world with lasting contributions. But it's also a day when we remember ordinary saints who we all have known and loved. So since today is All Saints Day, it's appropriate to ask the question, what does it take to be a saint? We normally think of saints as people who have led holy and exemplary lives. Mother Teresa, Augustine, St. Francis, or more recently, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, or perhaps the apostles, Peter or Paul. We may think of Stephen, the first martyr, and the many other committed Christians whose faith in God did not spare them from great peril. And yet, the Apostle Paul addressed many letters to the saints, the saints at Ephesus and the saints at Philippi. Now, who were these saints? Well, they were people just like you and me, saints by virtue of their faith and baptism and through Christ by the Holy Spirit. We are not saints because we are without sin. The Bible tells us we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Only one person was without sin, Jesus. Martin Luther said that we are all simultaneously saint and sinner. Or as the apostle explained it, with my mind, I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh, I am a slave to the law of sin. We are pronounced holy by God because Jesus took away our sins on the cross. Now, in Hebrews, it is explained, by one sacrifice, Jesus has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Saints can be great, well-known people or, or ordinary people like you and me normal, average people who have given their hearts to Jesus. People that the light of God shines through. The recognition of All Saints Day is an opportunity to rem remember the saints in our lives who have given witness to the resurrection of Jesus in a fallen world. Let's look at our scripture reading this morning. We read in verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, the 11th chapter of Hebrews tells us who some of these witnesses were, the first Christians looked up to. They were people like Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Moses. The writer of Hebrews reminds us of the hero, heroes of the past, named and unnamed, in order to prepare the heroes of the heroes of the present and the heroes of the future to consider Jesus. He endured hostility against himself for sinners, so that you and I may grow may not grow weary and lose heart. We tend to think of martyrs as people who have, who have shed their blood as saints, and rightly so. But the real meaning of the word 
martyr, is witness. The writer of Hebrews speaks of so great a cloud of witnesses. Who were the cloud of witnesses in your life? I can think of a great many in mine. Teachers and Sunday school teachers, relatives, people I looked up to, people of faith. In a way, I feel I'm standing on their shoulders. And if I look down, they too are standing on the shoulders of someone else. And they are standing on shoulders of someone else. Without those saints, I would not have the faith I have now. It's important that the chain of believers is and stays unbroken. unbroken. So let us run the race that is set before us with perseverance. When I was a lot younger and thinner, I ran track in school. One of the races was a relay. There were four runners in this relay. And as one runner finished his part of the race, he would hand a baton, a hollow tube, off to the next runner who in turn would do the same. If one of the runners dropped the baton or failed to hand it to the next runner, the race was lost. That's how I picture the great cloud of witnesses stretching back in time. No one has dropped the baton before you and the baton has been passed to you from them. What are you going to do with it? You can stand there and look at the baton, or you can remember and run your leg of the race and hand the baton off to the next runner. Looking to Jesus, the pioneer and protector and perfecter of our faith, we know that we can persevere. We know that we can endure. We know that we can do our part to be a part of the great cloud of saints stretching forward. We know all this because Jesus has run the race before us. And if we can imagine it, there is a great cloud of witnesses cheering us on. We know that we can preserve. We know that we can endure and finish our leg of the race that is set before us and pass on the faith. Verse 2, Jesus to Jesus, the pioneer and protector of our faith, who for the sake of joy that was set before him. It takes perseverance. It takes endurance to finish the race. When things get hard, the author of Hebrews reminds us to look past the one who has power of life and death over the body and to look at the one who has power over your eternal soul. It reminds me of the old hymn, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Jesus has taken a seat on the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus endured. Jesus persevered. Jesus finished his race and received his joy and his victory. And it can be ours as well. It can be the gift given to us and countless other saints. If we will only take up his cross, his victory is our victory. If we will endure and persevere and finish the race set before us, then we can join the saints of all ages who are in the cloud of witnesses. So here we stand, convicted by God's word of law. And we quickly realize that left to our own, the message of, if you do these things, 
God will bless you isn't going to help us a lot because the truth is we can't do it on our own. We can never be pure enough in heart. We can never hunger and thirst enough or be righteous enough or meek enough as the Beatitudes tell us, not on our own. And that's the point. If it's up to you and me to become a saint, we never will because we are incapable of earning sainthood. We can't earn our salvation. We can't earn the title saint. That's the reason Jesus came in the first place. Paul writes, but God shows us his love, his love for us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. And today, All Saints Day, we give thanks that Jesus has done all of this for the saints who have gone before us and have died in faith. They are now the great cloud of witnesses who have witnessed to you and to me. But we still have, still, we are still experiencing life's trials and troubles. That's part and always will be of life in this sinful and fallen world. And as we remember the saints in our lives who have gone before us, we shall have joy in our hearts for their message to us. But what about the next generation? Who will be their witnesses? The answer is you and me. It's easy to give up when things around us are looking bleak. Walking away seems to be the answer sometimes. But walking away usually doesn't address the problem. The same is true of our witness to others. Winston Churchill once was asked to give a commencement speech. When it was time for him to speak, he got up, put on his glasses, and opened a piece of paper. The audience waited for an encouraging speech to come. What words of encouragement, what words of an inspiration would this great orator share with the graduates? He looked at the audience and said, never give up. Then to the surprise of everyone, he folded the paper, took off his spectacles and put them in his pocket and sat down. Needless to say, the audience was stunned. Surely this couldn't be it. Maybe a joke. Maybe, maybe an attempt to be dramatic. There had to be more. Churchill stood up, looked around the auditorium and said, never give up, and sat down again. That was all. That was it. Now, I bet you can tell what advice I'm going to give you. Never give up. Those saints who went before that cloud of witnesses didn't. They witnessed so that we might be included among the saints. Now it's our turn. Never give up. Amen. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you both now and forevermore. Be at peace.